Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Tembu, thank you very much for your kind introduction, and to uh, Dr. Masinda, the program director, for your introduction as well. Um, <coughs> distinguished academics, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, I'm very happy to be here at uh, CUT. This is not the first University of Technology that I, I have addressed. The other two were in Natal, that's the DUT and the MUT. And MUT asked me to address uh, uh, them on ethics in business, which is very much uh, what uh, students of business and technology would be interested in, the responsibility of business. But here, as the uh, Vice Chancellor said, it is true that we have a wonderful constitution. And over the 20 years uh, during which I worked outside, people unfailingly told me that. You South Africans have a wonderful constitution, particularly because you have the right to equality and the right to dig dignity in your constitution. Um, so why, why is it very important to have uh, the right to equality in uh, a constitution because it is an explicit statement of principle that leads the ongoing effort to move towards a meaningful equality for all. The law is a formal expression of public policy that plays a crucial role in advancing social norms. The law sets the standard for what is right and wrong and influences social conduct. Many of my friends, human rights advocates in the United States, complain that the absence of the equality clause in their constitution, the U.S. Constitution, which was adopted in 1789, which has been extensively broadened uh, in respect of human rights protection, but does not have the right to equality. And I have addressed them, uh, U.S. students on this subject as well. And clearly it hampers them in seeking constitutional protection against many forms of discrimination, including disparity in salaries and police response to violence, because they are not dealt with as violations of constitutional principles. Earlier this year, there were public demonstrations in many U.S. cities protesting the fact that women there earned 77 cents to every dollar earned by men. And the failure of the police to provide blacks and women with equal protection of the law as a matter of right in the context of domestic violence is also handicapped by not having an equality clause. Anyway, that's what the lawyers there tell me. The Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, let's remind ourselves, explicitly determines in its preamble, the values of the democratic state to be human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. Let's look at some of the key provision. I just read you the preamble, which sets our value-based society. <coughs> Section 9.1 states, everyone, everyone is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection and benefit of the law. Section 9.2, equality includes the full and equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms. To promote the achievement of equality, legislation and other measures designed to protect or advance persons or categories of persons disadvantaged by unfair discrimination may be taken. So it's what we call our affirmative action clause, because obviously it's totally false to talk about equality for everyone when, when the large number of people are unequal. So you cannot compare equal and unequal unless you address the disadvantages. So happily, that's in our constitution as well. Section 9.3 states, the state itself may not unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone on one or more grounds, including race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth. And let's not take any of these for granted because in all the countries I have visited, there 
where there are no constitutions, then these forms of discrimination uh, continue unaddressed. At the time of the adoption of our constitution and largely prevailing today, the disadvantaged groups fell along racial lines, rich whites and poor blacks. The Constitution heralds not only equal protection of the law and non-discrimination, but also the start of a credible and abiding process of reparation for past exclusion, for dispossession and indignity within the discipline of our constitutional framework. But if a scheme, and I'm quoting now from our constitutional court, uh, Vice President uh, Justice Mozenecki, who said that the Constitution provides for reparation for past exclusion, but if a scheme is an abuse of power or causes excessive harm on those excluded from its benefits, the court may strike it down as unconstitutional. And uh, Justice Cameron, also a current serving judge on the South African Constitutional Court noted this in his book. He says the big affirmative action cases have yet to reach the Constitutional Court. The Court has not yet spelt out in detail what disadvantage is, what a category of persons is. Is it race? Is it class? Nor has the Court spelt out in detail how the design of the measures must tie in with the objective of attaining equality. And he correctly points out that the conception of equality is not an empty vision, nor is, is it merely formal. It is a practical goal that must be realized in substantive terms, making an appreciable impact on people's lives. It includes a promise of material rights that make it practically possible to enjoy equality. So 20 years into our democracy and after the vigorous rollout of reparation for past exclusion, the time may be now to begin a dialogue on whether the promise of the Constitution to, de to deliver equality and social justice for all South Africans is being compromised by remedial schemes that may amount to abuse of power or result in impoverishment for those excluded from its benefits. I began by saying how much our progressive constitution is admired all over the world. But upon my return home after 20 years, I find that many South Africans don't share this enthusiasm for the Equality Clause. They're very despondent uh, and very skeptical. And people are saying, we have an Equality Clause in our constitution, but ours is a very unequal society. So I'm going to return to that point, but first let's consider what it means to have a Bill of Rights embodying the right to equality and the right to dignity. Ours is a rights-based society. So who, the, who are the rights holders? The people are the rights holders. And who are the duty bearers? The government, businesses, and institutions are the duty bearers to deliver these rights. South Africa subscribes to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly on 10th December 1948, drafted as, I quote, a common standard of achievement for all peoples and nations. The declaration sets out basic civil political, economic, social, and cultural rights that all human beings are entitled to enjoy. Over time, this unprecedented affirmation of human rights became widely accepted by all states as the standard to which all governments should adhere. The Declaration, together with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, plus its two optional protocols, as well as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, plus its optional protocol 
form the International Bill of Rights. International Human Rights Day is now observed on 10th December, as you know, around the world. In 1994, President Mandela signed up to all the major United Nations treaties, including the Convention Against Torture, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW as we call it, and the Convention of the Rights of the Child, to name a few. The South African Constitution, the Freedom Charter of the African National mm -hmm. Congress, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights all incorporate the provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is the framework that lays the firm ethical foundations of our value-based society for full respect for the rights <laughs> of all persons and communities in daily interaction and also in the way politicians should conduct good governance, how lawyers and judges should ensure justice and how educators should be teaching. So people must be at the center of protection of human rights and economic development policies and the delivery of services, which I'm reading so much about uh, in, in our media. Earlier this year, our government ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This was long overdue, but it's a welcome commitment on the part of our government to both civil and political and economic and social rights, or as Mandela famously stated, delivering on bread and ballots. In leading the transformation to democracy, our government has enacted many enabling legislations, established institutions such as the National Human Rights Commission and the Office of the Public Protector, and has made huge strides in realizing human rights such as housing, health care, access to justice and freedom of speech and assembly. However, the situation is far from satisfactory for millions of people who have been left behind. But I readily acknowledge the tremendous steps that have been taken, the advancement over 20 years, because I've seen some terrible situations in the world. I came in last night doing some work for the UN and I've been, I was in Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Kenya, but particularly in the uh, Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, uh, I and my colleagues were taken by helicopter to the, uh, the fighting area where South African soldiers are also on the front line defending the civilians. Um, so it, not only is it uh, that they lack freedom from fear, they're under threat all the time. Uh, just days before I went, three women were killed. The rebel soldiers are hiding in the forest. And as we flew over the forest, I saw how difficult it is for the troops. I think there are five troop-contributing countries who are there to protect the civilians. So, of course, we care about everyone, and particularly everyone on our continent. We don't want to compare ourselves to the worst situation and say we're better off. We want to have true fulfillment and implementation of our Constitution and everyone's rights. Let me quote what our Chief Justice uh, of the Constitutional Court, Arthur Chaskelson, wrote as long ago as in 1997, when the first case on the right to health came before the Constitutional Court. And he said, social rights are indispensable to all other rights. The legal right to equality will remain a hollow paper promise unless there is a greater commitment and will to deliver on economic, social and cultural rights. We live in a society in which there are great disparities in wealth. Millions of people are living in deplorable conditions and in great poverty. There are high levels of unemployment, inadequate social security and many who do not have access to clean water or, do, or to adequate health services. The commitment to address these conditions and to transform our society into one in which there will be human dignity, freedom and, and equality lay at the heart of the new constitutional order. For as long as these conditions continue to exist, that aspiration will have 
a hollow ring. <clears throat> so, despite these advances made by the state that I referred to, many South Africans are not realizing their human rights, in particular their economic and social rights. Unemployment levels are high, 25%, and actually more than 50% among young adults. And that should concern students of this university. Income inequality remains high. Ventures Africa magazine reveals that the number of billionaires in Africa has more than doubled in the last decade to 55. World Bank figures indicate that the top 10% in South Africa hold 53.8% of the income. And I saw a pie chart that 53.8% of the highest income earners are now a mixed group. They're not just a particular race group. Statistics South Africa reveals that 10.2 million South Africans, that is 20.2% of the population, live in extreme poverty. Critical service deliveries, failures attributable to lack of education and skills, poor governance and rampant corruption are matters of daily concern for, for us because they hold up the delivery of economic and social rights to the most vulnerable, the poor. The public prosecutor Thule Madansela recently proclaimed that the country has reached a tipping point in its battle against corruption. Human Science Research Council warns that corruption is a major obstacle to realizing our constitutional ideals of freedom, security and justice. And, see, and business also does not escape responsibility for unethical behavior. Uh, senior managers are indicated as the number one culprit driving theft. 77% of all internal fraud was allegedly committed by senior and middle management, driven by unbridled greed. Billions of rands have been lost to theft, money that should have been used to deliver urgently needed social services. Those figures are from Price Waterhouse Cooper's South African edition uh, of 2014. <coughs> Poor governance practices threaten the functionality of the public sector. Each year, the Auditor General's records show increasing levels of wasteful expenditure in the public sector. Here again, cheating the public of valuable resources. South Africa has a good law the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Practices, passed in 2004. So really there is a need for greater political will to implement this law. I notice there is a bill under discussion now dealing with theft uh, relating to the infrastructure in South Africa. Now the United Nations Human Rights Council based in Geneva, where, where I was a secretariat, also adopted a resolution in March 2012 recognizing the detrimental impact of corruption on the protection of human rights and on the ability of governments to fulfill their human rights obligations, especially economic, social and cultural rights of the most vulnerable and marginalized groups. Respect for fundamental human rights principles, equality, non-discrimination, participation, of the public in decision making, transparency and accountability. All these are essential to the fulfillment of all human rights and must be integral to an effective anti-corruption strategy. So it has to be a holy, holistic approach. Now these are not only burning issues here in South Africa, although we are living here and we are preoccupied uh, <laughs> with these stresses, but they are also burning issues around the world. Despite the international and regional framework that I refer to, systematic human rights violations persist globally from conflict, loss of lives, massive displacement, increasing poverty and lack of freedom from fear and freedom from want. Now we all followed the Occupy Streets protests uh, a few years ago 
where civil society organizations in many cities of the world uh, gathered following the financial crisis and they highlight the need to be rid of unaccountable opaque institutions whose activities cause untold misery for people. Vibrant civil society protests and widespread media coverage highlight deep failures in our own country. The situation cries out for prevention of these violations, for investigation and for sanctions to gain accountability. When there's no accountability, no punishment, then impunity prevails. Impunity foments human rights violations and undermines the fabric of society. And in this worst case scenario I described, uh, this, uh, this is the situation. There is no accountability, no mechanism to have these serious violations investigated. And since I just come from the DRC, it broke my heart to see these little girls in the uh, little village of uh, Beni, that's where uh, the soldiers are posted to protect the civilians. They're all farming and they're unable to farm because they're being raided and killed. So the police are there just, the UN forces are there just to protect the civilians. But I saw these little girls burdened with carrying these uh, huge uh, canisters of water or loads of sticks and wood on an eight-year-old child um, walking for miles. And I thought this is a country that has the most resources in the world, the most riches, diamonds, gold, all kinds of minerals. So where is all that going to? So under international law, and I've made this clear again and again, so has the Secretary General of the United Nations, that the natural resources of a country belong to the people. And that's why there has to be transparency, accountability on the part of those who are contracting to um, mine these minerals. These contracts should be uh, transparent and open. Instead, in many countries, they are official secrets. And there is also a responsibility on, on uh, foreign companies who partner with our government to respect our constitution as they do so. So a human rights approach presupposes rights holders and duty bearers, as I said, and it moves away from the delivery of services as mere acts of charity to enforceable obligations. Now such accountability is increasingly being demanded by communities, social movements and democracy campaigners worldwide. So that is what I wanted to share with you. I would love to see students engaged in this process of asking the right questions and engaging in dialogue. Because world over, this is what students are doing. They are demanding accountability more and more. You will recall that uh, this is what happened in Tunisia when the Middle East uprising started. Just uh, a few weeks before that, the development agencies, and here I also include the UN development agencies, their report said how wonderful the economy was doing in Tunisia. The economy, economic growth was just so good. And yet a graduate student set himself alight and burned himself to death because he couldn't find a job. And that started uh, particularly the students going out into the street and then a ripple effect of uh, revolutionary change in all those countries, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt. International and regional human rights mechanisms, and so when I say mechanisms, I'm talking about the uh, Human Rights Council, which has a mechanism called the Universal Periodic Review. That council reviews the human rights record of every country in the world. They've done all 192 countries, South Africa included, and now in the second four-year cycle, they're looking at um, implementation. They're looking at whether the recommendations, for instance, made to South Africa are, have been implemented by the government. So don't just look into your national framework. We are part of the international framework, and there are steps 
to get states to implement the protection of, of and delivery of all rights. We also have the uh, uh, independent uh, experts. These are appointed by the uh, Human Rights Council, the treaty body committees, and the African peer review mechanism. All of these offer opportunities to the National Human Rights Commission, to NGOs, to academics and students to demand implementation of state obligations. It's also very important to follow what our government is saying in forums outside in the world. What are they saying that they've already implemented, but you don't see it happening here in this country. And actually that was part of my role as High Commissioner. I, obviously with my uh, office of 1,000 expert staff, drew the human rights report of every country. And we work very closely with civil society to put those reports together. So the um, member state reviewed what the government said, what the High Commissioner's report said, and they even allowed uh, certain national human rights institutions and a representative number of NGOs to participate in that hall. So there's very, very um, interesting information that comes out at the international level. And who should be following all this but students, and particularly students who are engaged in, in the technological studies as well. As I said, South Africa has largely incorporated its international obligations into its national legal framework, but there is a need for increased monitoring and accountability, and, and mechanisms are needed for implementation. National, provincial, and local structures can play a monitoring role they can focus on the internal functions of administrative institutions and serve as channels for implementation. Some of you may have heard that I have been appointed by the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal to chair the investigation into the xenophobic violence. So we are still interviewing, talking to people, but um, and really now I'm sharing my personal opinion on some of the things I've learned and, and I think that if we go to apply for a passport or uh, you're, a, you're a migrant or an asylum seeker fleeing your country out of fear, they are really given a run around with regard to documentations. So when we, uh, we have the opportunity to speak to people and then raise those complaints with the uh, provincial and national government institutions. So the Department of Home Affairs, who is responsible for the issuing of documents to asylum seekers, said, well, they only have, I think she said, 12 staff and they're dealing with 4 million people. And it seemed to me that one department didn't know what the other was doing all over the country. So that's why I meant there should be these structures where they all cooperate and work together across ministries and across departments um, in, in the provincial governments. Otherwise, you and I are going to be given the runaround and we don't know who to go to for the necessary uh, paperwork. Good faith efforts by government to ensure effective service delivery on the, on the ground can end up being an illusion of compliance as long as structures remain disjointed, poorly resourced, badly staffed and politically weak. So there is a need for stronger synergy among various state institutions, the legislature, the courts, the National Human Rights Commission, the Office of the Public Protector, enforcement agents, agencies and civil society organizations. Each one of us should watch the situation and raise the questions and engender a dialogue on these matters. South Africa and all the members of the United Nations are currently finalizing the draft post-2015 development agenda. Since what is agreed uh, at the international level has implications for our economic development, let me recall some of the submissions that uh, the UN task team, including uh, my former office, made to the 
members of the United Nations to say this is what we want to see in the post-2015 development agenda. Civil society all over the world, as we saw in the Occupy Streets protests, are calling for meaningful participation. They want to be part of the decision making, to be consulted. They want higher levels of accountability from governments and from international institutions. They want an end to discrimination and exclusion, a better distribution of economic and political power, and the protection of their rights under the rule of law. So economic growth, we said, is not an adequate measure of development. Rather, equality matters. The environment, environment matters and human rights matters. The real test to a grow, growing global population demanding a life of dignity is the degree to which they are able to enjoy freedom from fear and freedom from want without discrimination. It should not be seen as axiomatic that economic growth were accompanied by significant inequalities, environmental degradation, repression, and structural indignities is neither sustainable in the long term nor morally acceptable in the immediate term. Nor can a focus on any narrow, selective set of socio-economic indicators satisfy the real demands of development. Rather, as uh, President Mandela said, the people must have both bread and ballots. Now, under their Human Rights Treaty commitments, I said already South Africa has signed um, almost all the treaties and in uh, February this year signed the very important Treaty on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So, under the commitments they make when they ratify these treaties, states are obliged to aim for universal access to at least a basic level of social rights, to dismantle discrimination and, and achieve substantive equality beyond mere formal equality of treatment, which may include positive measures or affirmative action for the excluded and marginalized groups, and may include positive measures to ensure access to justice participation in public affairs, personal security, and freedom of expression, association, and assembly. Vulnerable, excluded, and marginalized groups, including the poor, including women, children, they require scientific, equitable, rights-based economic empowerment approach. And as such, the universally agreed and universally applicable normative framework for human rights is more relevant today than ever to the global challenges of development. Now let me uh, caution you that if you agree with, uh, with these concepts that I outline, well many of the governments don't. So uh, not very hopeful about how the post-2015 development agenda is, is going to go. So let me conclude with the story of South Africa. While millions of us are still struggling to get out of poverty and the deprivations of apartheid, the story of South Africa does show what happens when equality of treatment and opportunities are opened to all. So there are thousands of stories, but I will tell you of my own. My family came from humble origins. My forebears were indentured sugarcane laborers. Gandhi called that system of labor as semi-slavery. My grandfather lost both his arms in an accident in the sugar mill, leaving him destitute. And my father was a bus driver. The apartheid system was one of degradation and suffocating disempowerment for the majority non-white population. Nevertheless, my grandfather predicted that I will be a lawyer someday. And that became a family joke for many years. How can we get from there to become a lawyer? But I was able to continue to go to school and when I was 16 years old, I wrote an essay on the role of South African women 
in educating children on human rights. This news report attracted attention within my community, which was a poor community of Clarewood outside Durban, and that community raised funds to send me to university. Everything was seg segregated then, and I was discouraged from studying law. I was told by the registrar that no uh, white law firm will employ you because you, we cannot have a situation where uh, a white secretary has to take instructions from a black lawyer. So this is what we faced there, but I persisted, eventually earning my degree. My skin color <laughs> denied me entry to most law firms, so I established my own law firm. And when we gained our democracy, President Mandela appointed me to serve as an acting judge in the High Court, and I was the first woman of color to have that honor. I have since had the great privilege to serve as a judge in the International Criminal Tribunals, uh, as well as the International Criminal Court in The Hague, and as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights for six years. And I know all too well that my story is not a typical one. For every such story, there are many thousand others with no happy ending. Yet my experience growing up in South Africa taught me that change is possible. If there are minimum preconditions in place, and essentially the will to do so. Human rights have been a defining part of that change. I recall the day my father, then 88 years old, stood in a line to vote for the first time in 1994. And my daughter walked to the polling <coughs> officials to demand that her grandfather and other elders be allowed to vote first rather than to wait standing in this long queue. And I was startled. My own reticence and hesitation out of years of apartheid, compared with my daughter's confidence, brought home to me at once of how indelible is the mark of oppression, but equally how far we have come in South Africa within a single generation. The country's human rights laws and institutions have been and continue to be indispensable tools protecting individuals from the worst abuses of power, enabling them not only to vote, but also to claim other minimum requirements of a dignified life, such as access to clean water, elect electricity, health and housing. These laws and institutions, however imperfect, are often the last line of defense for the homeless in our societies and surely cannot be ignored by government, business and external partners. To the contrary, these laws and institutions must be explicitly implemented in the delivery of economic and social rights. So the South African story also teaches us that development, like life itself, is about struggle. Social change creates both winners and losers. Progress for the poor today can be wiped out by the powerful tomorrow. The international human rights framework is itself the product of struggle, born after World War II. A due diligence and task risk management system grounded in internationally recognized, nationally specific human rights standards is our shield of legitimacy in the struggle for advancement. It is a prerequisite and foundation to human rights-based policy coherence domestically as well as among external actors and our defense against arbitrariness and exploitation. Now, I have raised these serious issues under the subject of equality because this is what the people are crying out there. And I encourage the students of CUT to take the lead in holding the dialogue, asking the questions. Um, I do see that our students are active, but I wonder whether sometimes they're being distracted away from thinking about these key issues that affect their daily lives. The unemployment figure for the youth population are truly alarming, and especially for those of you who will soon qualify and enter the job market, uh, you want to ensure that your rights are delivered there. Um, 
And finally, let me wish you well in your studies on technology. I don't know anything about it, but I do know that that's where great advancement begins. Um, you know, there is CERN, which is situated in Geneva, C-E-R-N. That's the future knowledge. They just solved the riddle of how human life was created, how matter was created. They, they have the telescope down to the center of the earth. So, and so this is what is open to you, science and technology. CERN was the one that invented World Wide Web. WWW and they donated that free of charge to the world and I was so proud when I went there and saw seven South African students receiving their training there so do Google CERN and um, apply for positions it's highly competitive but there you are that's where science and technology should be going the future knowledge future technology to help us realize our economic and social rights. So thank you very much, uh, who is our moderator? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.